strictures about the only real difference is, and I'm not sure this is actually a difference from non-MD counselors, but uh, at least counselors with MDs have um, privileged communication. I don't know if counselors without MDs don't. Uh, but we have no privilege, and keep that in mind about your client's records, because you might want to, re you, may sh you should understand the vaguer your records are, the better for the client. <laughs> <coughs> Just in case something happens, that, you know, somebody wants to subpoena your records about said client, you have no right to refuse. Just keep that in mind. Um, I'm not downplaying the importance of ethics in counseling, not at all, but that's not what I'm addressing. The question I'm addressing is, uh, a bit more philosophical and at some level more fundamental. Is there implicitly a morality or ethical system in astrology? And Jeff's answer um, Friday was basically no. And I don't really disagree with that. But it has to be understood that that takes a particular view of astrology, a view of astrology which is completely plausible uh, given most of its recent history. And that is, it takes the view that astrology has no philosophical foundation whatsoever and is simply a disembodied collection of techniques for doing something. In other words, a technology. If astrology is simply a technology for dealing with the interpretation of and reading of planetary influences, then by itself that implies no kind of ethics or morality independently, of course, of the conventions we adopt as counselors. Astrology is, in fact, fully capable, and I think I demonstrated that last uh, yesterday with my lecture on the Picatrix, fully capable of being a completely amoral set of techniques used for all kinds of evil and horrible purposes. And Jeff raised the issue of what happens if astrology becomes an established discipline that is accepted by society? Won't it be used for those purposes? And the answer is, in the context of this view of astrology, absolutely it will be used for immoral purposes. No question. And that is a serious issue we have to consider. Um, the only reason why astrology is a relatively safe discipline at the moment is because people don't believe it. <laughs> I remember uh, shortly after the Project Hindsight translations first started coming out, somebody wrote a review of them in um, Mountain Astrologer in which she said, astrology is on the verge of becoming so effective that it's dangerous. And uh, she was right. Uh, we have actually gotten to the point where, well, actually we have always been at the point where astrology was dangerous, but it's gaining in power. And so the importance of dealing with the issue of astrology and um, ethics is becoming ever more critical. So my, the contention in my talk tonight is that astrology acquires an ethical or moral dimension only when it is placed in a philosophical and spiritual context. Only that kind of a context, in a context can supply astrology with a purpose or goal. And this goal will be established by the philosophical answer to the question, what causes astrology? Now, I don't mean physically. Uh, in fact, I am actually at this point a devout adherent of the principle that astrology isn't physical at all. I, they may find rays, they may find something, but those, I would argue, are co-effects, they are not causes. In fact, I believe almost all of the materialistic explanations for uh, mental, psychological, and spiritual phenomena are co-effects, not causes. When, for example, they do, uh, I've got the, which, exactly the type of scan it is, but they do these scans of the brain activity. You know, they actually have a movie of the brain flashing colors and things when people are thinking various thoughts. They say, ah, we're seeing the causes of these thoughts. Why are we not seeing the results of these thoughts? And that's pure metaphysical bias on the part of the experimenters. They assume that matter is the cause of spirit and not spirit the cause of matter, or more precisely, soul the cause of matter. And 
I think astrology is a very powerful bit of evidence to the contrary. Uh, and as I've argued many times in the past, this is the real reason why astrology is genuinely revolutionary. As I've said before, if we're right about this, the scientific metaphysics, not the scientific practice, the scientific metaphysics is wrong. And again, when I say scientific metaphysics, I mean the prevailing one. There are many people in the sciences who are out there on the edge, shall we say, of creative thinking, who would have no problem at all with what I'm saying. They are not, however, the ones who dominate the discipline in the universities. Okay. So what possible philosophical frameworks can we look for? Well, first of all, in the modern world, we have two basic uh, frameworks which could conceivably encompass astrology. Uh, well, not really, but they would be the ones you look for. They are the mechanist materialist paradigm, as I call it, or in my jollier moments, the M&M. &M. <laughs> and the other, of course, the Judeo-Christian religion. I'm speaking now primarily of the Middle Eastern and Western world, where the, uh, uh, the big three, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, um, are competing for who has the right idea of the one God. Although Islam would argue one, Christianity seems to be into three. Uh, oh well. <laughs> Having read a great deal of literature in Catholic theology or Christian theology at the moment in Latin, I can tell you that we have one great debt we owe to the Trinity, Western philosophy. Now, Western philosophy was founded by the Greeks, but the real precision and power of linguistic philosophy was a result of dealing with the complexity of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. <laughs> I'll bet you didn't know that. But if you've read the stuff I've been reading, it becomes really obvious. Every Wednesday afternoon last semester, and and other weekdays in previous semesters, a group of us gather together in the now Byzantine and Medieval Studies office and read over lunch Peter Lombard's sentences, a text written around 1150 AD, which was the master summa of all theology that every, every doctorate in theology had to write a commentary on before he could be awarded his doctorate. There are consequently hundreds of commentaries on this. And so we, in our modest, humble 21st century way, are adding a kind of ad hoc, extemporary commentary on it as well. Fascinating stuff. It's not what I plan to spend the rest of my life doing, um, but it's fascinating. But getting back to the point, let's take a look at these and see if there is any comfort they can provide by way of providing a philosophical foundation for astrology. Of course, with the mechanist materialist paradigm, uh, and its various spin-offs, our first problem, of course, is that according to it, astrology is impossible. This is not a good start. <laughs> but once you get past that point, good luck. Okay, let me be more concrete. If you postulate that there are indeed causal rays, you're probably not going to find any evidence, but let's just say for the sake of argument that rays are being transmitted, <laughs> that position provides absolutely no indication that there is any morality or ethics to astrology. Because if there are rays, they are neutral, they don't care about us, we don't care about them except insofar as we can manipulate them. <laughs> and so if, the, if we actually did succeed in accommodating astrology to the current philosophical paradigm, the current dominant paradigm, it would have all of the flaws and dangers that Jeff was describing. You can guarantee that if you took out an insurance policy larger than a few grand, an actuarial astrologer would look at your birth chart and would conclude, yes, that person is going to live long enough for us to make a profit, sell it. No, that person isn't going to live long enough to make a profit. And oh, by the way, it was widely rumored in the 1960s that in Germany they were using actuarial astrologers. I never found any definite proof of it, but it was widely believed that they were for the big policies, you know, multi-million dollar policies. My father, actually, who got me into this, made the following rather interesting proposition. 
Uh, he was one of the founding fathers, although most people don't know about him, of cosmetic chemistry. He was one of the first to take the principles of chemistry and apply it to the development of cosmetics. And in the course of it, invented the first successful antiperspirant. <laughs> Even worse, he developed the first depilatory. <laughs> and ladies, would you like to know what a depilatory does? It contains moth digestive enzymes. Moth digest wool. Wool is hair. <laughs> I think Gillette's stock just went up several points. <laughs> But at any rate, uh, testing the efficacy of drugs and uh, cosmetics was always an issue in his life. Uh, um, and he realized that astrology would allow you to create a testing company that could prove the adequacy or inadequacy of any pharmaceutical whatsoever by picking the right time to do the tests. No. And uh, he wasn't planning to do this, but you see, time is not recognized by modern science as a variable with different qualities. So nobody could look at the fact that you pick times and say, hey, you're doing something methodologically improper. Everything we methodologically absolutely kosher, except you elected a time favorable to the product. That's the kind of use we're talking about here. And yeah, I think that's pretty sleazy. Sort of my father, I have to say in his defense. He, it just struck him as ironic. <laughs> okay. So modernism, or mechanist materialism, as a basis for the ethical and moral foundations of astrology is equivalent to having no moral or ethical foundations. So I think we need to drop the rays or any similarly mechanical uh, foundation for astrology. And I think we can drop them with a great deal of scientific uh, confidence that they will never be found anyway. OK. Now, in the context of the prevailing monotheism, the uh, the Abrahamic religions, as people have recently become calling them. Uh, of course, once again, we have to get past the position of all three in their current modern forms that astrology is false. Um, in days of yore, the position of the Christian church, at least, was a little more charitable. It was real, but it was diabolical. That's not much of a concession, but at least it doesn't make us frauds. It makes us devil worshippers. <laughs> I have to say this is not an improvement. <laughs> However, in varying degrees, all three of these religions have made accommodations with astrology and astrologers at different times. The primary device is what I'll call the Inshallah maneuver. Uh, inshallah being Arabic for uh, according to Allah's will, um, or if God wills. Uh, which appears, at least in the Latin translations of the Arabic text, about the end of every sentence that actually makes, says something. You know, if you have, uh, if you have the, a debilitated son uh, in the chart, but its ruler is in good shape, the father will start out in poor condition and end up wealthy, inshallah, if God wills. Great escape clause, by the way. We have to keep that one in mind. <laughs> The problem with the idea of astrology as a mode for interpreting the will of God, however, uh, is that, at least in the Christian church, that sets astrology up as a potential rival for the theologians and the priests. And that thought did occur to a number of medieval uh, church people uh, with all the subtlety of a herd of galloping elephants. <laughs> and that was always a problem in astrologers. Basically, the deal that astrology made in the Middle Ages with the church is we will talk about nothing philosophical or spiritual, except, of course, in weird books like the Picatrix. And there you have it in a rather creepy form. Now, the problem I have with this is that the will of God, while it's maybe sort of more benign than blind fate, is nevertheless a kind of fatalism. It means, basically, you have no say in the matter whatsoever. Uh, you read the chart to find out what God has decreed. End of, start, end of argument. Now, again, uh, this, was not a, this was not exactly the view that Christian astrologers took in the Middle Ages. The way they would have put it is you are aligning yourself with God's will. And in that statement, I think actually they came fairly close to the truth. 
Um, but nevertheless, there was this idea which, all, which eventually became formulated in late medieval philosophy as uh, um, the potentia dei, dei absoluta, which means the absolute power of God. The absolute power of God meant was the theory that regardless of what natural law stated, God could at any time overthrow it and do anything. Uh, cor corresponding to this was the potentia dei uh, ordinata, which is the ordained power of God, which is what he actually did, which was to follow the laws that he had established. But that was only because he was a nice guy. <laughs> he could at any time, at any time, by the potentia dei absoluta, this universe could go comforting thought. Um, okay. I'd have to say that aside from this idea of being aligned with the will of God, the major monotheisms are not a particularly comfortable place for astrology uh, because they are, spiritually speaking, roughly equivalent to Microsoft. Uh, that is to say, there is only one God, one operating system, and all people shall bow to his will. <laughs> so, now we get to the heavy portion of our program. There are, in fact, three ancient philosophical contexts that have a lot to say about this, and the conclusion I've come to is these three, in a synthesis, actually do provide an answer, and I want to talk about them a little bit. The first one is Aristotle. Now, any of you who read Aristotle in college, you probably had something of what I like to call a trough experience. <laughs> That's the opposite of a peak experience. <laughs> Aristotle was one of the most brilliant minds in history, and he wrote some absolutely brilliant essays, we are told, because none of the brilliant finished essays have survived. <laughs> What we have are basically his academic notes or academic notes taken by students. And while they probably accurately reflect his philosophy, they are not exactly juicy reading. Uh, among the ancient philosophers, Plato was much the better read. Aristotle was much the more rigorous philosopher. Uh, the, the common saying in the Middle Ages was Aristotle was the greatest philosopher, Plato was the greatest sage which is really fascinating because they had almost none of his books, but his reputation had survived the loss of most of his works in the West. They were preserved in the East, specifically in Byzantium. Aristotle has uh, a few doctrines which are directly relevant to astrology and were in fact incorporated into medieval astrology. I'm not making this up in other words. One of the most important was the doctrine of the four causes which I think I've mentioned before, but I'll repeat briefly now. It's a great, this thing tells me how long I've been talking, so I know when I'm going over the line here. Um, these are, the cause, cause to Aristotle meant not something that makes something absolutely inevitable and necessary. Cause meant that which could be held responsible for something. And basically his four causes answered the following question. What do we have to know to really understand something? And his answer was, we have to know what it is in essence, that is, what makes it different from everything else, what is its total being and nature. What is it made out of? That's the second. The first one called the formal cause. What is it made out of is called the material cause. What caused it to come into existence is called the efficient cause, and that's the one we still have. When we say cause now, we mean efficient cause. And the fourth one was, why did it come into existence? The final cause. That one was thrown out. We, <laughs> we still have material causes in modern philosophy, uh, although we don't call them causes. We just say, okay, what's the material foundation of this? Uh, and we have the efficient cause, but the formal and final have been heaved. And that, had, that began to happen by the late Middle Ages, by which time anticipations of modern philosophy were getting fairly obvious although it took modern philosophy several hundred years to realize they'd been anticipated in the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> Aristotle was a biologist, and he, in non-living things, the formal, final, uh, material, and efficient cause were different. But in a living thing, he understood that the soul was the formal, final, and efficient cause of a living thing. 
Now, what does soul mean in Aristotle? Two things. It means that which makes a living thing alive. Simple. It's what's not present at your funeral. <laughs> at least not in the body. Right. Might be hanging around, you know, looking at the drinks or something, but it's not in the body. The, um, he also said, however, that in higher beings, the soul is that which makes that particular living thing and not some, some other living thing. It is, in other words, the form of what it is that you are. He referred to it, he referred to the soul as the entelecheia of the body, which means the formal, perfected manifestation of the soul. Of the, that is, the body became the formal, final, perfected manifestation of the soul. So we have a rather peculiar idea here, for which I coined a slightly new terminology, but it's actually implicit in Aristotle, that there is potential soul versus actual soul. It has exactly the same relationship as potential and kinetic energy. In fact, that idea of potential and kinetic energy is one of the few survivals of Aristotelian thought in modern physics. The potential soul is what you would be if you became perfectly what it is essentially you are. The actual soul is where you are at any given time. And I'll come back a little later to talk about what makes the difference. But the part that's really mind-blowing here for those of you who labored through Aristotle and cursed the day you were born <laughs> is that Aristotle is implicitly the first person to formulate the idea of self-actualization. Mm. Think about that a moment. Each of us is a potential soul attempting to actualize itself in matter. Interesting thought, don't you think? The second philosophical system that contributes to that contributed to the philosophy of ancient astrology was Hermeticism. And Hermeticism actually shared an idea with Aristotle, in fact, probably derived it from Aristotle, but gave a slightly different spin to it. The Hermeticists believed that the soul had three levels. And the lowest level was basically the aliveness of the body. As you may know, uh, it's a somewhat grim but true fact that when you die, your hair and fingernails keep on growing for quite a while afterwards. Mm -hmm. Because it takes actually uh, probably about 24 hours for all of the cells in your body to die after the brain and heart have stopped. So that's, the, that's this lowest level of soul continuing to operate. It's hard for us to remember that in addition to being who we are, we're also our other large cell colony. <laughs> okay. The second level is instinctual, and if conscious is not self-conscious. Um, Aristotle called the first soul, level of the soul, by the way, the vegetative soul, and he called the second one the animal soul. But the, um, the Hermeticists didn't use those words, but they gave the same description. And finally, we have the level of soul that is self-conscious and capable of speech and ordered thought. Um, in the wretched translation department comes the following. Uh, Aristotle made the statement that man is a rational animal. And those of you that uh, aren't terribly fond of the modern idea of rational probably find that a somewhat reductionist statement about human beings. The problem is, that isn't what rational means. What he actually said was, man is a logikos, zoon. <laughs> and that's a little different. Logikos, from which comes our word logical, means is capable of speech and thinking in terms of language. Mm. It is language that makes the humans uh, peculiar and unique. But logic, logos is even more general than that. It is a brain, it is a consciousness that is capable of intentional order of thought, and it knows that it knows. Yes. It is self-conscious. Self-consciousness is probably the single most important attribute. And I know I do not believe that it's restricted to human beings, but I don't think it's terribly evident in, shall we say, amoebas. <coughs> the way scientists usually determine if an animal is self-conscious is if you can figure out that its reflection in a mirror is not, it is not another animal. You can figure out that it's itself being reflected. And I'm not sure that's an entirely reliable test because cats will go after anything. 
Including their own tail, I and mean, I think it's right there, more than a dim awareness of themselves. It doesn't matter if moves, it's fun. <laughs> now, the lowest level of soul in hermetic, this is where we get into the hermetic contribution of this. The lowest level of soul, the soul of the cells of the body, is completely subject to astrological forces. This is stated explicitly. Completely subject to astrological forces. Because astrological force, this level of astrological force is natural law. So uh, the argument would be here, of all the things you're most likely to have somewhat faded, it would be illnesses, insofar as illnesses are completely biological in nature. Unfortunately, for the sake of this argument, illnesses are not completely biological in nature. There's a strong psychological component in them. People tend to get ill when they need a break. And that's not a physiological consideration. The middle soul is also highly subject to astrological forces insofar as it is allowed to run the show. So the other area that is most subject to astrological forces, and this one I think we've all experienced, are the emotions, which is this middle level. In my own personal experience, I have found that I most vividly experience astrological influences as emotional changes. The events may or may not happen, but I can count on the emotional changes. I believe at some level they're the real effect. And the events are either our being unconscious about our own emotions or are the result of the activity of our own emotions. So the emotional level of the self is extraordinarily subject to astrological influences. In theory, at least, the highest level of the soul is capable of being completely free of astrological influences. Now, I don't think, I think this is going a little too far, and I will talk about exactly what I mean by that in a moment. I'd say a better viewpoint might be that the highest level of the soul is capable of working with astrological influences at the highest possible level. This gives you a kind of freedom, and I don't mean that facetiously. It gives, you, it, it gives you the most real freedom there is. The freedom to be what it is you in fact are. The third philosophical system, which actually synthesized the other two along with Platonism, is Neoplatonism. Now, Neoplatonism, and this is implicit, implicit in Hermeticism too, which actually shows a strong Platonic influence, but I'm giving these in roughly their chronological order. Neoplatonism has the rather radical idea that everything begins from something they call the one, Tahain, about which you can say absolutely nothing, except that it is the source and foundation of everything else, and it is one. Hero Israel, Lord thy God is one. I asked somebody once if the Hebrew could be translated as Hero Israel, Lord thy God is the one. And he said, actually, yes. But Hebrew, like uh, many other ancient languages, is a bit loose on the subject of article adjectives, mm -hmm. like the. Uh, it does have one, but it isn't used wherever you expect it. It's used kind of arbitrarily. Um, uh, Greek does the same thing. Latin just simply dropped the whole idea. <laughs> there are no article. There's no article indefinite or definite article adjective in Latin, although several evolved. Okay. The one generates a thing that is called in Greek nous, which means universal consciousness. But more to the point, it means it is that which truly is. All, it contains not only all being, but all of that which knows being. It is the subject, object, identity and diversity, rest and motion. Um, it is in fact the first, it represents the first archetypal functions. And uh, the first archetypal function is very simple. It is identity and diversity. Until you have difference, you have nothing. And at this point, let's see if I broke it. I've done this before, the pocket comb. Anybody remember the pocket comb? Yeah. The pocket comb exists because where there's a pocket comb, there's a pocket comb. <laughs> because where there isn't a pocket comb, there isn't a pocket comb. If this pocket comb were everywhere, it would be nowhere. That's how identity and difference works. 
same principle as the zero and the one. <laughs> Which is interesting because we've gone back to that. Um, as a matter of fact, I've often stated that information theory is the first practical application of pure Platonism the human race has come up with. Where does Microsoft Word go when you turn off the machine? <laughs> Could it be it's the same place the soul goes at death? I doubt it. <laughs> Actually, I think it goes back to Bill Gates, but... <laughs> Okay. Uh, Neoplatonism uh, had a flaw in most of its incarnations, at least, that was similar to similar flaws found in Hinduism, uh, uh, some branches of Buddhism, and most other major religions of the West, uh, of the whole world, actually. And that is that it regarded the physical universe as a place to be escaped from. The goal of life was to transcend this world. And I think you can see this theme is somewhat evident in Christianity, uh, somewhat evident in, in uh, Islam, not quite so evident in Judaism. Judaism, interestingly enough, is an exception to this principle, that in Judaism you are supposed to engage this world as fully and completely as possible, and there is no morality in avoiding it. And that's, I think, maybe Judaism's outstanding glory. The idea there's only one God, I think, is small potatoes compared to this one. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the first two major Neoplatonists were Plotinus, who lived in the mid-third century, and Porphyry, who was a student and, uh, um, of the next generation, basically. Um, they believe, oh yes, uh, I back, let me back up a moment. I left out the last two stages of this emanation. The one generates consciousness, which generates soul. And the difference between consciousness and soul is that consciousness in the realm of noose or higher consciousness or consciousness period, there is no time. Everything that ever could be and ever will be is permanently. And that's what eternity actually means. Eternity is not endless time. Eternity is the simultaneous present. Soul brings in movement. In fact, the essential key of soul is movement. To a Neoplatonist, all movement is a sign of soul. Now, here's the part where Neoplatonism really stands modernism on its head, but good. Soul generates the physical universe. It isn't that the physical universe has a soul. It's more accurate to say soul has a physical universe. Now, this idea that life and awareness and consciousness begets the physical universe is an absolute inversion of, the, of scientism. Absolute inversion. Interestingly enough, astrology implies the same thing exactly, that soul precedes matter. To a Neoplatonist, the planets operated, the pl physical planets were simply material bodies that were encapsulated in soul, and the movements were actually occurring in the world soul. And because we participate in the world soul, the movements are occurring in us. This is the Neoplatonic explanation of astrology. But getting back to Plotinus and Porphyry, Plotinus and Porphyry basically bought the idea that the physical universe was a place to be escaped from. Um, they didn't regard the physical universe as evil, but it was a bloody, uncomfortable place to be, and if you have a choice, get the hell out. <laughs> and I have to admit, there are times when that's an extremely plausible metaphysical worldview. Um, especially when you're living in a culture where the hygiene isn't quite as developed as it is here, um, and there are all sorts of strange things going on. And, you know, it's hard to have a high regard for a body which stinks. Now, let's be put, not put a fine point on it. Bathing was not a big deal, uh, although in the Roman cities it certainly was, and that's probably why they did it. Uh, it's actually the Middle Ages that uh, brought the practice of non-bathing to a high art. Uh, and it's probably the best reason why I would prefer not to visit. <laughs> but at any rate, to Plotinus and Porphyry, uh, the planets were not evil or good or anything, they were just out there. But um, the soul never fully descends into matter. To Plotinus and Porphyry, our souls are all basically 
uh, fragments of the world soul that are suffering from a delusion that they're separate. And, they're re and we're really aliens here. And again, the best thing we can do is understand that we're aliens and get the hell out. Now, Plotinus is, is actually a beautiful philosopher, don't get me wrong. His stuff is absolutely moving and magnificent. Probably the West's most authentic sage. But uh, there is this anti-cosmic attitude in both of them. More so in Porphyry, actually. Porphyry is one of these people who has a tendency to like hair shirts. You know, make things gratuitously painful, just to remind yourself you don't belong here. Uh, but Venice wasn't into that quite so much. Uh, Porphyry, however, begat, uh, philosophically speaking, a Syrian who went by the Hellenized name of Yamblichus, which actually is derived from uh, Ya Melkos, in, or Ya, ya Melka, I think it actually is in Syrian, which means God the King. It's, he's one of the few ancients who actually kept his Semitic name, although it's gotten got Greekified, which is what Hellenized means. Um, <coughs> he uh, took a radically different position. He said, the soul of each individual human being has descended completely into matter. It is completely severed from the world soul. It is immersed in matter and is normally not capable of rising out of it. This sounds really grim, I grant you. Except that he's not convinced that this is a totally bad thing. That's the difference. He's not convinced that the soul being in matter is a totally bad thing. Implicitly, he says, if a soul can align itself properly with the cosmic nexus into which it was born, it can assist in the manifestation of providence, which in Greek is pronoia, in, the, in this world, and thereby become free of the lowest manifestations of fate, and become the instrument and manifestation of divine providence. However, there's a lot that has to be done before this can happen. I think anybody who's done a chart has some idea of the problem. <laughs> um, I'm going to read you a passage from Yamblichus, which will take a little while, so bear with me. And I'll comment on it as it goes, because translations of Greek philosophers have a tendency not to resemble simple English, uh, because Greek and Latin have a tendency to write really humongous, ponderous sentences. And the translate, I've never seen a translator who was able fully to escape that problem. It's, it's, it's difficult to completely translate a foreign language <coughs> without some influence from it. He says, to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is because this is preceded by a lengthy discussion. No. <laughs> the movements of fate around the world may be likened to immaterial and noetic activities and revolutions. The order of fate resembles this intelligible and pristine order. What he's saying is, the movement of the planets yes. is a physical representation of what is going on in soul and consciousness at the universal level. This, by the way, is a philosopher of astrology. It's the real McCoy. Secondary powers, and then in brackets, the, the translator added, and cosmic gods, that means gods within the cosmos, but that is to say here, are joined with primary causes, hypercosmic gods, that is gods that are outside of the physical universe as we know it. They join together and the, with the multitude in generation, that is, they make stuff happen here, putting it simply. And thus all things under fate are joined with undivided essence and with providence as a guiding principle. In other words, at some level, we are all joined with pure being, and all of this movement is a manifestation of pure being happening in the material world. Providence is here. It's unavoidable. It's inevitable. It is, in fact, fated, as he says in the next line. In accordance with the same essence, then, fate is interwoven with providence, and in reality, fate is providence and is established from it and around it. Now, what's the there is a difference, however, between fate and providence, and it's really important, but we'll come to it. Then he, and I'm skipping a paragraph from the text now, and going to his conclusion, wherefore, since the soul is allotted certain parts from all of the parts and elements of the cosmos, and uses these, 
hear what's coming here. It is contained in the order of faith, takes its place in this order, fulfills its conditions, and makes proper use of it. And to the degree that the soul combines in itself pure reason, self-substantiated and self-moved, soul is formal, final, and efficient cause. Because this philosophy is descended from Aristotelianism. It is liberated from all external things. But to the degree that the soul extends into different modes of life, falls into generation, away from consciousness is the implication, and identifies with the body, it is sown into the order of the world. That is to say, it cannot escape, or it cannot transcend, would be more accurate. Escaping is actually not the goal. Transcending is the goal. That means you are here fully and completely, and at the same time in touch with what is beyond this. That's the tricky part the two of them together. Now, Gregory Shaw, who wrote uh, a text called um, Theurgy and Soul, which is a masterful book on the subject of Yamakis' philosophy, very much in print, uh, makes the following comment after this. And just in case you think I'm making up my interpretation, here's what he says about the passage I just read. The parts given to each soul from the totality of the cosmos made up its astrological portrait. And it was this confluence of elements at a particular juncture in time and space that made up the soul's localized self. The somatic, which is to say physical, embodied testing ground that measured the soul's ability to integrate corporeal existence into a divine pattern. Now we're getting to the punchline here. We always manifest the divine pattern. That's inevitable. But that we manifest it consciously and intentionally is not inevitable. We can manifest it unconsciously, unintentional, unintentionally. If you have a room full of furniture and somebody turns off the lights, you can undoubtedly cross the room, but you'll keep running into chairs and tables. If, on the other hand, you have a light, i.e. consciousness, you can avoid the tables and chairs and navigate across the room. And if you are supposed to cross the room, you are fulfilling your providential destiny. Failure, getting back to Shaw, failure to fulfill the conditions of the body resulted in fixations, unfulfilled conditions, and the subsequent suffering of fate. In other words, an unconscious manifestation of the material in your chart causes you, I love the fact that he uses these terms, fixations, unfulfilled conditions, and the subsequent suffering of faith. This is what the actual soul is at any given time, except for those rare people who actually achieve the full manifestation of the potential soul. These people are called enlightened beings. And uh, I don't think I'm being uncharitable when I say that it's highly improbable that anybody in this room will achieve that status. And if any of you are going to, please look me up. <laughs> I will sit at your feet. <laughs> but don't bother asking me to do this until you arrive, please. <laughs> if anything I don't need, it's a bogus enlightened meeting. <laughs> and I have run into a few. <laughs> Anybody remember Rajneesh? Oh, God. Uh, yes. Okay. I may be unkind, but I think at this point I can say that you do not get really strong indications of being an enlightened being. Horny old bastard. Is what? He was a horny old bastard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he was, it, it, there were respects in which he was seriously into the body, no doubt about it. <laughs> the proper care of the body and somatic life, however, freed the soul from these bonds and allowed it, as Yamlikas says, to see the turnings of fate to be like the perfect revolutions of the stars. Now, what's, what we're saying here, he's saying, and I'm agreeing, um, is that the purpose is not to disengage from the physical universe. The, perfect, the purpose is to manifest the essence of what you are so completely that you are an aspect of the creation of the physical universe. For Iamblichus, the descent of the soul into body may be a severance from the world soul and an experience of profound alienation, yet it is also an opportunity to become an aspect of the world creating process itself, but only to a conscious being. 
all right, what does this have to do with ethics and morality? I think actually you may be getting a hint of it by this time, but let me spell it out. After all, that's what I'm supposed to be doing here. And I always believe in doing my job. And of course, if you disagree with me, that's perfectly okay too. This is one person's viewpoint. The potential soul and the actual soul are the key. The potential soul is what we really are. But it isn't necessarily manifested here and now. The second is how we manifest at any given moment. Both have the same astrological symbolism. But the actual soul will have varying degrees of disturbance and deviation from the proper hierarchy of the self. Very simply put, what makes us neurotic, weird, and dysfunctional is the degree to which the two lower levels of soul are taking over the function of the highest level. I know that in New Age circles, it is supposed to be appropriate to be in, to feel and to be in touch with the body and all those things, and you know what? That's absolutely right. The problem is, I don't think people fully understand what that means. Uh, I'm fond of making a distinction between feelings and emotions. Feelings are actually about consciousness. It's a perception. You're getting information. You're experiencing. You're in touch. Emotions obliterate them. They're all coming from disturbance. They're all the movement of irrational powers within the self. When you are angry, you are not perceiving a truth about the outside world. You're experiencing an aspect of yourself that has gone berserk. <laughs> and it is with heavy heart I say the same thing is true of falling in love. And I think those of you who have been around a few times have probably gotten this by now. <laughs> and it's very different from loving someone. The difference is that in loving someone, you're, you have a strong feeling of bond, of bonding with somebody who's really there. Falling in love, you're having a strong delusion of bonding with somebody who isn't there. <laughs> <laughs> or rather, isn't outside of yourself, to be more accurate. Falling in love, love is falling for a big TV. Profound piece of music. Yeah. In varying degrees, we all have the highest level of soul operating under the dominance of the lower levels, rather than the other way around. As such, we operate mechanically. And we react to the energies that we experience coming from the planets, rather than co-acting with them. That's the difference right there. Reacting versus co-acting. The potential soul is the possibility of complete self-realization, of making the self real within the world. It does have a kind of existence outside of the normal temporal spatial environment, perhaps within the world soul. It pulls us toward itself and its manifestation. That is, it pulls us toward itself and the manifestation of itself. So the distance between the potential and actual soul becomes less and less. Most of us will not realize the complete union of the two, but that is the goal. The moral and ethical foundation of astrology that follows from all of this is that anything that assists the process of increasing the level of awareness of a human being so that he or she clearly knows his or her own self and makes conscious choices based on that knowledge follows the morality of the art. Any practice that reinforces irrational attachments, negative emotions and destructive desires, that increase the levels of passion and decrease the ability to see and perceive clearly is an immoral use of astrology. The negative stuff of the picatrix falls into this category because almost all of them are the use of divine spiritual energies for egoistic ends. And egoism is a reduction in consciousness. The kind of astrological uses that Jeff feared in his Friday speech would come to pass if astrology became acceptable. All of those things, however, fall into this category of the more immoral misuse of astrology, all of them. They are all consciousness reduction activities. Any astrological use that neither expands nor contracts self-awareness and does not hinder the realization of the self within the world is neither moral nor immoral. Properly done, however, is likely to be more moral than immoral.
because making oneself happier, genuinely happier, is a positive goal. It isn't easy to make the distinction between uh, the need to be made according to this principle. It's not always easy to say whether a piece of advice or suggested tactic falls into this category. We will make mistakes, get used to the idea. Humility on the part of the astrologer in the face of an unfolding self is always required. But if we hold to this or some similar approach to astrology, it will evolve into an increasingly ethical and moral system. As we evolve, so will astrology. Finally, proper life is one in which the soul embodies and counters the unfolding of the divine plan in nature according to the divine plan within the self as it is revealed in the chart. It does so in a state of the highest possible awareness not driven by passions, not operating as a mechanical system, but through a free choice in which it freely chooses to do exactly what it is supposed to do. That's pronoia. You choose to do exactly what it is you're supposed to do. It turns the operations of fate into the operations of providence. And the soul, so oriented, becomes not a prisoner of matter or fate, but a co-creator of the world. An aspect of God experiencing itself, acting upon itself, and knowing itself for what it is. Um, I want to end this uh, with two things. A, a slight modification of a passage from the Gospel of Thomas. And uh, I want to end this talk with a brief incantation of the Neoplatonic name of God. There is such a thing. When you know yourselves, then you will be known, and you will understand that you are the children of God, however you conceive it. That's the part I added. But if you do not know yourselves, then you live in poverty, and you are that poverty. Mm. And this is the name of God according to Greek philosophers. Uh,
with you. There are those who've been issuing drugs to the staff. <laughs> and we would like to, anyone who was volunteering and participating, please stand so that we can see who you are. Yeah, there's a thousand out And as whole an individual as Laura is in all respects, <clears throat> she's not the totality of Norwalk. There was but one individual with whom she started this entire procedure, and they were together the mothers. And boy, with a project like this, it takes two moms. It's kind of like, imagine having two moons in your chart. That's what it's like. And so, let us recognize the matriarch, the ultimate matriarch of her life.
and wisdom which have been rendered through this weekend. Might we, the recipients, absorb all that we have taken and make it part of ourselves at our very core. Might we carry this with us as we go forth into the world. And might we be silent manifestations of the forces divine. And might we be examples of consciousness that will help others see the way. As we depart each other's company, waiting once again for reunion, let us carry this energy in our memory, in our being, and might we maintain all of the consciousness that we have received here and share it with others in our beacon way. And for that we give thanks. Aho, amen, whatever you wish. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's up time. Woo